Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, dear brothers and sisters and friends. Welcome to the first installment of the Muslims in Industry series. We are going to show you a quick introduction, promotion video, and here we are again. Let's begin today's session. Today we are here with Shamim, uh, who has been journalist in the mainstream media for over 20 years. And moderating this session is my dear brother, and is, he's also a journalist in the field, Afzal Ahmed. Uh, he is a journalist and broadcast news producer from the UK. And he is currently living in Turkey, focused on Muslim issues and the Asia Pacific region. He is, as well as you, very much interested in this session as much as you are. So now I will hand it over to him now. He will be moderating the session. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, brothers and sisters. Uh, so yeah, I've been given the amazing responsibility of uh, chairing this um, uh, session, um, the Muslims Industry Series. Uh, so Sumbul, um, of course, is... Uh, created this series to look at uh, professions that Muslims are, are in that are, are very underrepresented. Um, so for example, journalism, uh, I mean, me growing up, um, uh, I mean, myself, I'm a journalist, uh, broadcast news producer, I've been working for the last seven years. And um, as I've grown up, I mean, in terms of the mainstream media, I have, I mean, there's like a dark, dark uh, amount of journalists who are in the mainstream and uh, representing our voices, um, you know, both Muslims and also ethnic minorities as well. So I'm from the UK and I mean, this has been a very, uh, you know, it's, it's been a concerning issue. And, uh, you know, my friends, my family, um, you know, my community, I mean, there's very few uh, of us in the media. So this is a great topic to discuss uh, and, who, who can do them better than my friend and my colleague, uh, Shamim Chowdhury. Uh, so she's been a journalist for the last, let me just get uh, amazing details up. So she's been a journalist for over 20 years. Um, I mean, I'm still a junior, so, you know, she's kind of like a mentor to me. She's worked for some of the world's leading broadcasters, like Sky News, Al Jazeera English, TRT World. She's also done short stints at the BBC and ITV News. Um, she's also a very well-known print journalist as well, writing for the Independent, the Huffington Post, and she's covered, you know, she's covered issues all the way, all the way from wars. I mean, she's a foreign correspondent. But and did you know she's actually the first ever female British Bangladeshi staff foreign correspondent at a twenty-four hour English language channel? Um, she's also an amazing cook. And uh, if you're with her, she, you're well protected. She has a black belt in Shotokan Karate. Uh, but let, let's show you a video of her work before I let her, um, uh, you know, take the floor and uh, and give and you know give her presentation on uh, representation in the media. This used to be one of the largest YPG training bases in the Afrin region. It's known as Muaska Talaya, and just about five days ago, a Turkish airstrike ended all activities here. The military offensive is very much ongoing. The front line is about 200 meters from where I'm standing, and in this area, there's been an extensive cleanup process. This truck was on its way to deliver aid, but it's been stuck here for the past 40 minutes because of the thick mud caused by monsoon rains. It's also been looted. Many Rohingya jumped on board and took sacks of rice. The people here say they can't make ends meet because the cost of living is so high. They're angry at President Macron and they want him to resign. Were you ever a member of Daesh? No. Were you ever tempted? No. Were you ever approached? Uh, I think they had a lot of methods to recruit people through the media, even within 
the Northern Territory, but... Uh... Were you ever personally approached by Daesh while no. you were in Syria? No. The Russian Ministry of Defence says it has lost contact with a military aircraft. 14 personnel are believed to be on board. Russian officials say the IL-20 aircraft had been returning to an airbase in Syria when it disappeared from radar on Monday evening. The YPG caused destruction throughout this entire town. They would base themselves in some of these houses and when they wanted to move from house to house, rather than use the main road, they would break the walls, just like the one I've just been through, so that they would be able to pass undetected by drones. Give us an idea of what other reports are coming up through the week. Well, we're going to be looking at uh, rural enterprises run by women, women making money all across the countryside. We're going to be looking at the pharmaceutical industry, which is doing very, very well, exporting more to more than 140 countries. Nara was 17 when she escaped with her sister three years ago. She's just one of thousands of unaccompanied minors who've escaped North Korea. It is a massive blow for the Conservative People's Party. They have got, uh, according to these exit polls, between 67 and 73 seats. It's the worst in their history. We've been here just 15 minutes and at least 200 Rohingya refugees have passed us. We're being told that at least 2,000 will be crossing this point this evening. Welcome back to TRT World, a reminder of our top stories. The leader of North and South Korea will attempt to revive stalled denuclearization talks as they meet in Pyongyang. Well, you have been hailed as the man taking on Aung San Suu Kyi. Is this personal? This case is um, neither about me nor about Aung San Suu Kyi. We need to bear in mind that 80% of COVID-19 cases have been mild and the death rate is just 2.3%. So just how difficult is Indian dance? Let's find out. Uh, welcome back. So that's some of the <laughs> amazing work that uh, Shamin has done. Um, so without further ado, I, I just Briefly to explain the program for you. So Shamin will give a um, presentation, looking at representation in the media, uh, especially the mainstream media, um, advice for uh, any of you young budding journalists. Uh, after that, we have a short break, uh, say for about 10, 15 minutes, um, you know, get your tea, coffee, um, re-energize for the lively Q&A, which we'll have, which I'm sure you're all looking forward to. Uh, so without further ado, I'll hand it over to Shamin. Uh, so Shamin, first of all, can you hear me? I can hear you fine. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can everyone else hear Shamin? Well, they're all muted, so <laughs> let's oh, hope yeah. they can. Yeah. Yes, they're messaging, so uh, yes, they can hear. Okay then, Shamin, right. to you. Uh, I will just go get a tea break or something like this. Carry on. Thank you, Afsal. Salam alaikum, everyone. Hoş uh, geldiniz, as we say in Turkish, which means welcome. Thank you uh, so very much to Afsal for that uh, lovely, very generous introduction, and of course to Mohammed Sumbul for um, organising the event. And my thanks to the Istanbul uh, Youth Collective, uh, Muslim Collective, and uh, Istanbul Youth Organisation. Um, it's an honour to be here, and uh, a double honour to be the first in this series and I can only hope that um, I do it justice. Um, so I will start off by um, very quickly just uh, whizzing through my uh, journalistic background. I am going to run through it because um, I don't want to be, you know, talking for hours on end about what I did, you know, five years ago or ten years ago. Um, and then I will start talking about diversity and inclusion with a specific focus on uh, Muslims in journalism. I've got some statistics that I will, um, we will put up on the screen and then we can uh, have a think about them and then we can have a discussion on them. And then we, I will just throw some ideas out there. Um, why is diversity and inclusion so important? Has it been addressed as effectively as we all no doubt believe that it should be? Um, and so I'll just introduce some uh, subjects for us to think about, but really 
you know, we, um, Afsal and uh, Sumbul and I want this to be interactive. I don't want to be talking for hours on end. So I will try to keep it as brief as I can. And then as Afsal said, we will have a bit of a break and then feel free to um, pose any questions you wish in the chat box. Um, and then, you know, I can discuss them. And those questions will lead on to other themes and other issues and bring up topics that hopefully will be of interest to everyone. I did a, a similar um, talk some months about, back with Northwestern University in Qatar, um, the School of Journalism, and the kind of the discussion interaction part, interaction part worked really, really well. So very quickly, and I think at this point, Afsal um, will hopefully put up one of my uh, Word documents that's got a list. It's very basic, I'm afraid. I tried to make it interesting by just adding lots of colour to it, but it's actually just a series of words. Um, but uh, that gives you an idea. I think, I don't know if it's big oh, yeah, enough. You guys can, um, we can gallery view and you can see our screen. So you can see what uh, Shereen is talking about. Okay, so as you can see from here, it says UK Border Agency as the top job. Now, that may come as a bit of a surprise to you, but that is actually um, what I did before I became a journalist. So, um, so in that sense, journalism was a bit was a kind of a career change for me. Um, so for five years, I was, believe it or not, an immigration officer. I used to stamp passports at Heathrow Airport. I used to do a lot of asylum interviews, which all actually... Um, ended up being very relevant to, um, uh, to my work later in life as a journalist. Um, so I did that for five years, but all that time I was working towards becoming a journalist. I was studying part-time, doing a part-time master's degree. I did a journalism course and various bits and pieces, worked for my local paper. I then left the UK border agency to go back to study full-time to City University, where I did in those days, uh, it was a postgraduate diploma. These days, they've changed the course and they're all master's degrees now. When I was there, it was a postgraduate diploma and I did it in newspaper journalism with a view to becoming a newspaper journalist. I envisaged myself perhaps becoming a feature writer for The Guardian or something like that. Um, so I ended up doing that course. And then uh, from there, I was lucky enough to go straight onto a national newspaper. I got onto a traineeship um at the daily express which was not the daily express as it is these days before you kind of think well that, i'm not very impressed you know with that it was actually a very good paper i promise you and they had a very good training scheme um and they took on about five six people every year and i was very lucky to get onto it because it was quite sought after and i got some excellent grounding um as a newspaper journalist uh, for two years at the express they would move us around from desk to desk um, every three months or so. So I ended up doing everything from personal finance to foreign news, um, environment. I got to meet David Attenborough and um, other, other you know, famous people, Joan Collins. I even did the gossip column, the diary, um, for about six months or so, where our editor would send us out every evening to all these events to kind of um, book launches and um, um, premieres of, of movie nights and theatre theater productions. And it all sounds very glamorous, but actually it was very, very nerve wracking because he would get a list of celebrities in advance and he would say to us, you are going to go to this event and talk to this person and get a story. And, and the first thing he would do when we walked into in, in, into work in the morning would say, so what's the story? So this is going to be there or, you know, Clive Anderson or all these people knowing that you have to go and not just talk to them, but get a story out of them. And actually it was excellent um, grounding for my future journalistic endeavors. Um, so from the Express, I freelanced uh, for a couple of years or so. Um, newspapers, oh no, 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 oh my God, I've forgotten my own history. Uh, from the Daily Express, I actually went onto a traineeship at London Tonight, which is the independent London regional television news channel. And uh, I, um, uh, I did about nine months there. Very good training. I realized very early on that local news didn't really do it for me. I just, I just wasn't excited by it. My passions didn't lie in local news, but nonetheless, it was excellent, excellent training. From there on, I freelanced for a couple of years, went back to newspapers, including the 
Daily Mail. I'm not sure if I should be admitting that. Um, and uh, I did about three months on the Daily Mail, just on the news desk. And it was at the time, I, I don't expect many of you to remember, but it was the So Murders. Um, and um, uh, it was this young man from the town of Soham who kidnapped and murdered two young girls. Um, it was a massive story in the UK at the time. So I remember working on that. Um, and after that, I got a short term stint at the BBC and I decided to leave. And my the editor at the Daily Mail, and, I, and I'm sure many of you know the reputation the Daily Mail has. And if you don't, for non-Brits, um, it's, it's, it's very right wing. It's very inflammatory in many ways. It um, is not received very well by thoughtful people, people who have a more kind of compassionate and inclusive outlook on life. It's considered to be quite narrow minded and quite um, insightful of amongst other things, Islamophobia. Anyway, I decided to leave and my boss said to me, oh, I'm very disappointed because I thought you could really fit in very well here. And I wasn't really sure how to take that. I found it a little bit disturbing, <laughs> I have to say. Um, and then I did various things. And then I ended up at Sky News um, on the foreign desk. And that really was a turning point in my career in the sense that this is when my career became streamlined. Prior to that, I was really, well, there was, I mean, to a great extent, I was just doing whatever work I could, I could find because, you know, I needed to work. I needed to earn a living. Um, but it was really when I, when I started Sky News, I just wanted some shifts. I just needed to get paid. I needed a job. And the, my boss at Sky News, he said, we need people on the foreign desk. I didn't ask for it. He said it. So, for those of us who believe in fate, I think that was kind of a, a telling moment. Um, and that was my introduction to 24 hour news, television news, and most significantly, foreign news. Let me tell you and, and I um, fell in love with it. Um, and it was really, really hard work. We had to do uh, night shifts. Um, which were from six in the evening till six at night, uh, six in the morning, and then back again in the evening. Um, it was brutal. It was really, really tough. But I will be always be grateful for my three and a half years at Sky News because they beat me to like they worked me like a donkey, and a lot of the time it was very unpleasant and um, very you know newsrooms. Um, as Afsal will know, can be extremely predatory. This one took the biscuit. Um, but really, I mean, it taught me everything um, that I know today. And the work practices are very, very professional. And I am still applying those standards, you know, all, all these years on. So I did that for three and a half years. I was basically um, what we call a deputy news editor. Without going into the technicalities of it, it's kind of like an assignment desk role where you are liaising with um, people in the field, correspondents, um, kind of monitoring what stories they're doing. There's a technical aspect to it as well. Um, so it's kind of like encompassing a whole range of um, um, newsroom uh, responsibilities. From there, I went to Al Jazeera. Um, as soon as I heard of Al Jazeera English, I was determined to join, um, and I did. And I ended up being there for almost eight years. Um, and that was an extremely fruitful experience because that's when I started doing on-camera reporting. I was still doing news, news uh, desk work, the, the kind of thing that I'd been doing at um, Sky News. But I also um, expanded my repertoire and I started going out on the field. I started uh, uh, field producing and reporting um, and they were very good to me. They were very, um, you know, I would pitch stories that uh, they weren't off, off diary stories as we call, call them stories from my community, from the Bengali community. Uh, my ethnic background is Bangladeshi and from the Muslim community that they would not necessarily have picked up. And they really gave me a platform to kind of tell those stories. Um, and it was very satisfying because I would follow the story all the way through from kind of inception to planning, to going out and filming, coming back, editing, scripting and all the rest of it. Um, so I really started doing more and more kind of on, on camera work um, at Al Jazeera. 
Um, and, you know, I covered some, I covered the Rana Plaza. Um, you may remember in Bangladesh, there was a massive factory collapse where more than 3,000 people died back in 2013. Um, I was in Bangladesh for that as a field producer. And I also did a report. I was in Bangladesh for the 2014 elections. Um, and uh, we also did some special series. So really became um, really quite involved in all the stories that Al Jazeera were doing um, on Bangladesh. I managed to secure the Prime Minister, Bangladeshi Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, um, for an interview after the network had been trying for six months and they'd had four attempts and failed and I managed to secure her, which was um, which was very pleasing. I managed to secure the Bollywood superstar Amita Bachchan for a sit down interview. So I kind of found a niche, you know, I mean, it's a pretty obvious niche, but it really worked for me. And um, not least because, you know, I have a genuine special interest um, in in uh, in all things Bangladeshi and also all things South Asian. Um, so I did that and then I heard about TRT World, new startup, Istanbul. Who would not want to live in Istanbul? I mean, that's reason enough um, to come here. You can see, you can get a taste of how beautiful it is um, just through the, just, just um, behind me, you can see that is the Bosphorus Bridge of which I have a view of from three vantage points in my apartment. Um, and if this looks beautiful, then this is really just a hint at how beautiful this city is. Um, very, very exciting time, uh, 2015. It was, everybody was new and we were all very excited and full of energy and, um, you know, having this, you know, going out every night and just couldn't get enough of the beauty of this city. The work was fantastic. Um, I started as a senior producer and within about a space of a year or so, I was promoted to correspondent. And really from then on, the next three years were non-stop. And uh, I was covering, I mean, I was just basically on a plane every month going to um, the Philippines and Korea and Jerusalem and Sri Lanka. Bangladesh, I've lost count of the times I went to Bangladesh on so many stories. Um, and I also, my dream came true. I always dreamt of covering the Bangladeshi elections myself. Of course, I did go with Al Jazeera, but that was really as a producer. And from that moment onwards, I would dream that one day I would be that person in front of the camera, you know, on election day, um, you know, talking to the presenter saying, well, you know, here I am, here I am in Dhaka and you can see the polls behind me. And uh, it happened, alhamdulillah. Um, so it's been a very, very busy time. Um, and it's, TRT has catapulted me to, uh, to heights that I could only have dreamt of, for which I'm very, very grateful. Of course, this past year has been very different. I've been staring at the view behind me most of the time because of the pandemic, as is the case, as has been the case with most reporters all over the world. But that doesn't take away from the fact that um, it's been an incredible, um, an incredible journey. Um, and as Afsal mentioned, I, I'm also a print journalist as well. And I've kept up my writing. I've done op-eds for the Huffington Post and um, The Independent. I've written um, online features for TRT World. And I also did that for Al Jazeera as well. I said it was going to be short. I think it has been anything but. But anyway, that's my career. Now, diversity and inclusion. Why is it important? Should it be an issue? Let's have a look at some statistics which will remind us that it is very much an issue. Um, and it is something that we should be. And of course, it's hot topic. It's all very trendy to talk about diversion, diversity, inclusion, um, and all of that. And you hear it, you know, it's all kind of in vogue and especially on the back of Black Lives Matter. But if you look at the statistics, it tells a very different story. I don't want to bombard you with figures, but let's, this is really, it's not so much about the figures. It's really just to give you a sense of how these issues have not yet been addressed adequately. So according to the creative Diversity Network, which is a UK um, uh, network, a diversity promotional organization. The latest report shows that the number of ethnic minority groups, I'm going to talk broadly about ethnic minority groups now before I go on to Muslims, just to kind of give you an overview. In 2019, 
12.3% of people working in newsrooms in the media were from the ethnic minorities. That's gone down. In 2020, it was 11.8. So it's dropped. It should be 13%. 13% is what is representative of the UK population. It's not near that, and it has dropped. The European Commission, a European Commission report in 2016 on hate speech, hate speech added that hate speech among traditional media, particularly tabloid newspapers, continues to be a problem. Uh, so this is, we're kind of, uh, we're still broadly on the same subject, but really we're moving away from representation within the media to what the media itself is producing, which we will talk about. Reuters Institute 2016, I mean, I know it's going back a few years or so, but I think it's still quite telling. 6% of journalists across the UK newsrooms are not white. That is against 13% of the general population. That's really quite low. Um, Afsal, could you just uh, scroll down a little bit, please? He, I think he's disappeared. Uh, thank you. Stop, 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 stop. Uh, yes, great. Thank you. Uh, now, Ofcom uh, d uh, diverse, did, uh, did a report just last year, 2020, diversity and equal opportunities in television and radio. Now, it said that employers are taking on more people from ethnic minorities. It is quoting 14%. However, it did go on to say that minority groups are underrepresented and represented in management and senior positions, 8%. So that is not 13%, uh, which is which is the average. And I think that's that's all we've got there. I don't think I added anything on there. So let's move on to the um, to the next uh, to the next um, set of statistics that I uh, found when I was doing my research today, um, because this 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 uh, event is about Islamophobia or anti-Muslim. I know some people um, have. Um, some legitimate issues with the term Islamophobia. So I've put anti-Muslim sentiment there as well. So um, now, according to the European Islamophobia report, and this is this is actually a report that is commissioned by the European Union. And this is just some, these are just some random anecdotal examples I've given you just to give us a sense of the anti-Muslim sentiment that is out there. 52% of the 5,680 people who were interviewed um, uh, oh, sorry, oh, um, who suffered uh, hate crimes, religiously motivated hate crimes were against Muslims, 52%, even though uh, Muslims make up far less in terms of a percentage um, in the UK. Nearly half of all Conservative Party voters, the Conservative Party is one of the two major political parties in the UK, believe that Islam is incompatible with a British way of life. In France, 676 uh, Islamophobic incidents, incidents since 2018 compared to 446 in 2017. So it's gone up. Um, a Gallup poll showed revealed that 52% of Americans do not respect Muslims, 48% in Canada and 38% in the media. Uh, in the UK, sorry. So this gives you a sense of how Muslims are still perceived in Europe, in the Western world. This has a direct bearing on the mainstream media, most of which is uh, English language. So we will stick with that. We need to kind of narrow it a little bit. Because of course, you know, I mean, the media is just, it's not just the English speaking world, but because of my own background and because a lot of these problems, because the Western media is so influential um, around the world, I think for the purposes of this evening, I think it's better if we just um, kind of stick to that. So I've given you um, a sense of where I come from, what I've been up to, and the climate that we are facing at the moment in terms of a lack of representation and inclusion. Um, uh, in in the mainstream media and the kind of political backdrop of that, which is the continuing rise of Islamophobia across Europe um, and across the Americas, these statistics confirm that. Now, where does the mainstream media uh, come into all of this? Well, it, it plays a direct role. Um, on the one hand, it is feeding us information, giving us news um, that we all need against this backdrop of, um, uh, of, of an, of an un, unbalanced playing field, if you like. But on the other hand, it, has a, it is hugely influential in shaping our views, 
in shaping our um, ideals and uh, to an extent our values, not just us, but those who do not have the same values and do not come from the same religious background as ourselves. So all of this plays a really big part. This is why I believe um, the the discussion, the uh, the narratives have to continue. There needs to be um, a rise, a greater awareness, whether any of you are planning on to going into journalism or not, or perhaps your family members are, perhaps your children or your nieces or nephews or cousins want to go into journalism. Even if you don't, if you, even if you just have a kind of passing interest in news, you need to be aware of all of this when you absorb the information that is out there. And of course, that information is growing you know, going um, year by year, thanks largely to the to the uh, internet, we access information a whole lot more easier than we have done at any time before. But that doesn't necessarily mean that um, it's necessarily um, leading to a, a, a more adjust, a more representative society. So I think I have spoken for a very long time, and. Um, um, I haven't actually kept time. So Afsal, I'm going to I'm going to ask you if you want to come in here. Um if you are there. Yes. Um do you I mean there are some other points that I can bring up if you uh want to do that or we can take a bit of a break or we can uh have a bit of a feedback and then take a bit of a break. Um what do you what do you say? I mean uh, I haven't found it so uh, tiresome, so I think we can, I guess, go straight to the Q and A, which I think will, um, you know, take a large portion of time, and we can take a break in between uh, if you like. Um, but is that okay? The other thing, one, if we want to go straight to Q and A. If you want to, you know, the uh, one thing I will, I'm uh, sorry to interrupt, Afsal. The one thing I will say before we take the Q and A's is, I mean, everyone, feel free to ask questions on on chat and i will try to answer every single one of them um i don't think we're too pressed for time so it should be fine um i am aware that i have um thrown a lot of ideas out there in a kind of a kind of you know at times unstructured way um perhaps i've given hints of things that you would like me to elaborate on and expand on perhaps there's aspects of my career that you feel like you want to know um, something about, or even if you don't necessarily have a question, if you feel like there's a comment that you want to make, please feel free, um, and I will try to answer them to the best of my abilities. When I'm kind of giving this intro introductory talk, it's very difficult to get everything in without bogging people down with too much information, and I don't like to do that, so... Um, you know, it was all very brief, but it doesn't mean to say that we can't go back and talk in greater depth about some of the things that I've discussed. Okay, um, we have a question from uh, Ali G, which is quite funny. <laughs> so he's saying, what's the difference between TRT and Al Jazeera? Did you have the same freedom to share the stories you want, or have you been directly, directly directed to focus on specific topics? Uh, brilliant question, Ali G. <laughs> it's funny. Is that really your name, Ali G? <laughs> um, excellent question. Um, a very good start. Uh, now, TRT World is the state broadcaster. It doesn't hide the fact that it's a state broadcaster. Um, it is very clear in its mission in that it... Uh, once there are many parallels between Al Jazeera and TRT, but there are differences as well. The parallels are that both channels um, have a mission to focus on stories that are not delved into by other Western media. Um, stories from Africa, stories from Asia, um, stories that have a Muslim emphasis, the Islamic world, not necessarily because they feel that they are more deserving of airtime than stories elsewhere, but because history has shown that these stories have been neglected. So it's a way of redressing an imbalance that we have been seeing for decades. Um, so in that sense, the two channels are similar. 
Now, TRT is the public broadcaster. Al Jazeera is a private organization. Um, a public broadcaster, as you'll find, whether it's the BBC or from any other country, they will want to promote their country and their government. There's, in, I personally believe that there's nothing wrong with that. Why shouldn't, if you are a public broadcaster, that's what you do. You, as long as you are objective and you stick to and you respect and honor journalistic principles, if you want to, uh, to tell stories or highlight things that the Turkish government is doing, as long as it's done truthfully and in a balanced way, I personally don't have a problem with that. So yes, of course, TRT is going to, I mean, Al Jazeera is not going to broadcast, you know, every single thing um, President Recep Tayyip Erdogan does or says. TRT will, will, and it has the right to do that. I don't have a problem with that. Um, every state broadcaster will pay particular emphasis on um, stories that its country has a particular interest in. And, and the one that I can think of in our case is uh, Syria. That's by no means um, the only example. Uh, uh, Turkey has a lot of, does a lot of humanitarian work all around the world. Of course, it's going to ensure that the stories that come out of that work um, will be aired on TRT World. So there is a difference in news agenda. I think it's not really surprising, um, but there are many parallels as well. In terms of um, do, uh, do you have the same freedom to share the stories? I personally have never had any editorial interference on anything that I've done. I can only speak for myself. Um, I uh, write my own script. I've never had anyone say to me, change this or change that. However, there are guidelines um trt guidelines in our star book which i have to um respect and i have to adhere to and if i don't like it i need to have a serious think about why i'm working for trt world for example we have a particular stance on syria we have a particular stance on uh the rise of, is of islamophobia in europe those are trt's mission that th 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 those are part of trt's mission statement I have to respect that if I want to work for them. If I don't, then I need to have a serious think about whether I want to continue working for them. Um, but in short, I've never had anyone say to me, say this, say that. If they did, I would have a huge problem with it. Um, I hope that answers your question. Yes, uh, I just want to add something, I mean, It's the same yeah. with the BBC, for example, in the UK. I mean, if you look at the news coverage, they, they have a heavy focus on the royal family. Um, Absolutely. Of course, they have, of course, they have red lines, you know, huge red lines on that. You would not see the BBC reporting negatively about the royal family, for example. So every, I, think, I think every um, broadcaster has red lines. Um, so not, there's no, uh, in, in my opinion, there's no um, broadcaster or even any newspaper that's totally unbiased. That's, imp that's an impossible aim. But you can at least, uh, you, can, you can aim for, you know, subtlety. That's the, you can aim to be um, as by, uh, unbiased as possible. Um, but every I think, uh, effort, yes. Yeah, you can aim for that, but that's an ideal, but it can never be achieved. I every agree. Effort. And also the distinction needs to be made between um, bias and emphasis, airtime. You know, there is a difference. Bias kind of opens up a whole kind of, you know, kind of possibly dodgy territory, whereas emphasis doesn't. Because if it is a story, if it's a genuine story, and if it is told in an honest um, and objective form, that's not bias. Now, if, the ter if, if TRT wants to give, you know, 12 or 15 minutes of a one-hour news broadcast to um, uh, its, its, its foreign minister in Russia, because they've had struck a... Uh, struck a some kind of gas deal or pipe deal and it wants to do a full 15 minutes on it and the BBC does a 10 second on it I don't see what's wrong with that I mean this is you know this is a huge huge deal for Turkey and it's the public broadcaster I think the problem is and certain channels I'm not going to name them here but I think we can all know what they are I think the problem is if you if you twist the truth I think you know if you um and there are channels out there English language channels that are guilty of that I think if you take information and you put so much of a spin on it that it really becomes very far removed from the truth that is when you have a problem and trt doesn't do that um, okay so now uh, let, let's move on to um, i think in terms of why the reasons for you can say the lack of muslim voices in mainstream media 
Um, well, are we gonna? About... I mean, there's. I think we've got loads of questions. Yes, yes, yes. Here, so I'm actually. gonna I'm gonna fit the next next question in. Um, so I wanted to pose a question. Um, do you think it's also the attitudes of our community, I meaning contributing to this sort of lack of represent, representation? For example, we get pushed to you know a lot of. Sorry, say that again. Sorry, repeat the question. So is it because? Do you think it's also because of the attitudes of our community? You know, from our parents, from our community, uh, from our elders, from our family. Uh, we're pushed into more, uh, you know, more harder professions like medicine, engineering, and I, I guess journalism is almost seen as a softer, you know, less uh, important um, profession. Um, yeah, I mean, I definitely think that was the case if you go back a couple of generations or, you know, a generation or so. Certainly when I was growing up, um, journalism wouldn't even um, enter into anyone's, um, I don't think they knew I don't think it was it was that it was doctors or engineers or lawyers um or go and work in your dad's restaurant if you don't like any of those <laughs> um but I think it's changed I mean you know a lot of my younger uh, nieces and uh, younger cousins a few of whom are actually joining me today thank you for your support family lots of my family on here today so um thank you very much everyone um I know younger um the younger generation it's it's very much a viable uh career choice now and one that is as respected as um the more kind of traditional professions and i know that many of my friends their children um friends from similar backgrounds as myself want to um uh uh, want to go into journalism so I think that, that those attitudes are kind of changing now not just in journalism but you'll see that you know young uh, our community is um, a whole lot more you know a whole wider range of careers are becoming you know viable options uh, that people are taking seriously now than that they wouldn't even have considered um, you know 10 15 20 years ago I mean even things like dancing you know You've got professional dancers, fashion designers, architects. Um, you know, I think. I think. Um, yeah, yes, I think. Yes, I think. Even like in my, uh, I remember. I mean, I'm, I'm glad you said that it's changing, because when I sort of wanted to get into journalism, in my university, I was literally the only, you can say, Muslim. In, you know, there was like Koreans. You know, British people. Uh, you know, English and natives uh, and others, but I was literally like the black sheep in the, in the whole uh, well, But good for um, good for you for going against the grain. It was good, yes. Um, by now, let's look at trailblazer, uh, trailblazer. Uh, so uh, just <laughs> just a thing for everyone. And now you can unmute yourself if you want to, and you know jump in, or you can ask a question to Shamin. Um, I'm getting a whole I'm, load of. Anybody, you guys who are, I think people who are on this, a lot of my cousins and friends are WhatsApping me. I, I can't, I'm not going to look at the phone until, there's no point WhatsApping me because I'm not going to look at the phone until we have our break. So probably so, best just uh, let's to... let's move to the next question now. Yes. Uh, from Leah. So yes, my cousin. Her, my uh, cousin Leah in the Cayman Islands. Okay. Wow. Cayman Islands. We have a uh, global following. Uh, so she's saying, are there diverse, are there diversity hires in major media companies? Is this, a, is this like a policy yes. that yes. companies are implementing now? Uh, yes, because there are laws in place now where they have to fill quotas. But this in itself raises um, a very interesting quest, uh, question about whether diversity is fully addressed just by having, is it a box ticking exercise? The general feeling is that um, there are diversity hires, to answer your question, Leah, but it doesn't necessarily solve the problem because the issue remains that uh, of whether there is an inclusive culture within the organizations themselves, a culture which in which people from different groups feel welcomed, feel that they have the same opportunities, feel that they are part of the team, feel that they are not going to be uh, subtly uh, discriminated against. You know, all of these issues remain. There is a general feeling that filling quotas does not solve the problem. The problem is very, it's more nuanced than that. It's more complicated than that. 
and it hasn't been effectively addressed. And I'm of that camp. I do believe that. Of course, it's good that companies are now legally obliged to make sure that their newsrooms are representative. Um, and they have to. Ofcom rules. Ofcom is the kind of um, the um, uh, regulatory body in the UK. Ofcom rules state that no matter what kind of a channel you are, you have to show that you are recruiting people from um, all backgrounds and also with disabilities and gender equality and all of those things. Um, and you are seeing that. Um, you know, I can't deny it. You know, um, but it doesn't really go all the way to address issues surrounding diversity that still exist and certainly from the statistics that i have shown you seem to be getting worse which is so what, can you, so what can you advise them um i mean if you, if you if you were a member of the board on one of these companies like how would you change things or is it i mean if you had the chance for example if you uh, if you, if you want a journalist and you got involved in the more I meaning not journalist my meaning you're on the more higher executive board and you're given the chance to change um this sort of pattern what would you do gosh i mean i think we would need to um i think there needs to be more research into what makes an inclusive work environment i think if you look at a work environment as a microcosm of society as a whole then um it needs to reflect that so for example you know you need to be sensitive of people's religious beliefs you know muslims will they have somewhere to pray other religions as well you know let's not forget you know that there are you know, many religions in the UK, um, sensitivity in language, sensitivity in um, how we deal with each other, cultural sensitivities, that kind of thing. Also, you know, I think um, we need to uh, be careful of the language that we use. Um, I mean, I know this sounds very general and I can't speak from a kind of expert because I'm not, you know, a diversity officer. Um, so I can't I can't really speak from from that perspective. So um, but I think, you know, they can also um, seek guidance from community representatives. You know, there's the um, there are there are representative bodies of all communities in the UK and they are professional representatives and they can advise large companies on how to go about changing their culture to make sure that it is more inclusive. Um, I mean, this is a bit, bit, bit of a kind of very general response that I've given you, but um, I mean, that's 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 what I would suggest. Okay. Um, in terms of now, um, I have a question from Ibrahim Rafi. So he's a Spanish Moroccan journalist. Oh, hold on. What about the one? Hold on, Ibrahim. Ibrahim Rafi. Black. No, the yeah, one. The one before that. I'm, I'm going to go to I'm going to go to uh, the other Ibrahim's uh, question later. Uh, oh, okay. okay. Let's look at that on the topic of because you talked about in terms of TRT focusing on uh, a lot of in terms of Islamophobia in Europe. So yes, uh, he was, yes, it's an important about, subject. Uh, Spanish yeah. media, uh, particularly for organisation or observatory of Islamophobia in Spanish media. So uh, Ibrahim, I don't know if you want to if, if you want to specifically ask uh, something on based on what you've written in terms of your uh, statistics. Um, so you can unmute yourself. You can ask ask her directly what specifically you want to ask. I mean, it seems to me as though, um, good evening, um, Ibrahim. It seems to me as though he's, uh, you're making more of a point, really, just um, kind of, um, yeah, so I want to know what, what, just kind of trying, trying to, trying to, uh, you know, give us a sense of what the, you know, what it's like in Spain. And it doesn't surprise me at all. I mean, there is a, you know, there is a, a growing rise of Islamophobia all across Europe. We know that far right parties have been gaining greater prominence, um, you know, from uh, you know from the Netherlands to um, you know Viktor Orbán to Italy to the UK. Brex Brexit is in many ways um, an example of that, exa an example of rise in xenophobia. And that's going to filter down these, the, you know, what's happening in the higher echelons of government and in politics is naturally going to filter down to the average person on the street. So that doesn't surprise me at all. And I think it's really worrying.
carrying, for many of us who were born in Europe, um, you know, this kind of, um, you know, uh, fortress Europe that we are living in, it really, it is extremely worrying. So looking at those statistics, Ibrahim, that you have put on there, you know, it really, I mean, it, it, it saddens me and it gives me a sense of foreboding for the future and what it means for the likes of us who have were born in Europe and will go back to Europe and, you know, are our children and our nieces and our nephews and future generations. I mean, it, 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 paint, it paints a gloomy picture, but that's why, that is, that is really, that's precisely why I think people like us, people in this group, uh, the younger generation, um, this is why there's more of an imperative, a more of a need to be aware of what is happening and how, what is happening is being reflected in the media because awareness brings is the first step to empowerment. So, you know, I'm hopeful that change will come. We, we, we have responsibility. Okay. Um, so, so, so I guess we can move on to, um, so it, going, back, going to uh, Ibrahim Abbas's question. So he's saying about, uh, do you think the Muslim media, especially now, let's we're looking at now Muslim media, uh, especially media in Muslim countries like Al Jazeera, TRT World, are they representing Muslims enough? Um, uh, I guess in terms of uh, are they are they being a good enough voice as an alternative sort of outlet for people to consume news? You know, see issues such as Palestinian matters, uh, Kashmir. Um, you know, even like. Uh, covering uh, Islamophobia in Europe and Islam. Yes. Even in the. In well, America. I mean, if you, I mean, I'm assuming you're asking me for my personal opinion. Uh, yeah, in yeah. my personal opinion, yes, I believe they are. I believe they are. Uh, not only because Muslim issues, um, socio political, economic, on on all fronts, were pretty much silenced until the likes of Al Jazeera and TRT came along. Um, that's not to say that something, you know, something that is better than nothing is adequate. I don't even think that. Personally, I think the likes of TRT World and Al Jazeera do um, a very, um, um, a great job, actually, putting these stories across. They put a lot of, you know, without meaning to sound loyal, I have to say, in particular, Al Jazeera um, puts a lot of resources into these stories and has done has done since its inception back in 2013. Far more than um, Western media, far more than any other English language media. Um, so yes, I, I I think it does. I mean, you just need to look at the Rohingya refugee cri coverage, or both on uh, TRT World, which was me. <laughs> Um, but also um, Al Jazeera. I mean, Al Jazeera were fantastic. I mean, they had, you know, three teams, two, th two teams, three teams out there pretty much for an entire year. They just did not take it off their news agenda. Um, same goes for Kashmir. Same goes for Palestine. Um, so I think they are doing an adequate job. Yes, I do. Okay. Um, let's have a look at a question from... I guess we, uh, now in terms of uh, I mean, uh, in your opinion, uh, what's who, what organization would you say? Would you say to uh, to people to consume? I guess uh, get their news from one outlet in particular, or should we, you know, consume various different uh, news um, avenues and? Uh, organization. That's a very good question. That is a very, very so good question. Can you get, get into this whole, um, you know, partisan, you know, all right, I'm not going to... That gonna is a very good question because, see, you, no, no, no. Yeah. I mean, of course, no, I, 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 I think that's an excellent question. And the reason why it's such a good question, uh, there are two reasons for that. One is that, um, you know, you know, it's that thing like if you're a Guardian reader, you know, sometimes you need to have your views challenged. For example, I hate 
I personally hate the Telegraph or the Times, but I will read them because you need to know what the other per the, 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 you need to know what the other side is thinking, right? There's one. That is one reason. Um, and I think it's very healthy to get different perspectives. You know, I think you need to. I think if you uh, if you do if you are if you are kind of broad in what you read and what you uh, watch, you getting two different perspectives, even if you don't necessarily agree with one of those perspectives, will give you a deeper understanding on how different people view the world. And I think that's really useful to know. I think it's really useful to kind of have that knowledge. Um, and the other thing is, it will actually, um, if you're thinking about going into journalism, I would say that uh, read widely because, again, using the example of the Telegraph and the Times, I mean, I find them obnoxious and offensive, and yet the standard of writing is actually very, very high. Does that make sense? So, you know, you need to challenge, I think, I think everybody needs to get out of their comfort zone. I'm a big believer in that. I think you need to be challenged. I think that you have are strongly against. I think it makes you better equipped. Um, I think it makes you, um, you know, it gives you kind of greater tools, greater weapons with which you can fight your cause. They always say that, you know, know how your enemy is thinking and, you know, that kind of gives you strength. I mean, enemy is a bit strong here, I know, but people with different perspectives and different views don't, you know, I, I just, I just, I'm very uncomfortable with this idea of, you know, becoming too much in our kind of, you know, surrounded by people who think like us and, you know, agree with everything that we do and, you know, preaching to the converted and all of that. I think it's, it's really healthy to kind of read opposing views and watch opposing stories. The only thing I would say is the only where the, the place where I draw the line is um, by all means be diverse in your in instant news and current affairs and whatever it is that you're interested in, um, but stick to quality. So I would say, you know, I don't waste my time with, you know, the problem is with the advent of the internet, you know, there's so much stuff out there. A lot of it is unsourced and you might need to be really careful about unsourced material, conspiracy theories, you know, random stories that, you know, don't have any kind of substance to them. Um, be very careful about what you uh, take in and do go to um, well-sourced, reasonable, reasonable sourced media outlets, whether you agree with them or not. It's very healthy to get a different perspective. You know, for example, off the top of my head, if we're sticking to mainstream media, um, you know, if you read something in the New York Times or the Washington Post or Haaretz, Haaretz is, is very good. I actually really like Haaretz. Um, um, the Guardian, you know, BBC, Al Jazeera, um, you know, others, you know, DW News does excellent documentaries and um, excellent online stuff. Read widely, watch widely, you know, it can, or it will just be an enriching experience, but just uh, make sure that it's reasonably reputable and well-sourced. Um, okay, uh, let's have a look. Have I might ask for a few minutes break, actually, cause just because I just need to run downstairs for a second. Um, okay. How are we doing for time? Uh, we're doing good for time, it's 10.45, yeah, just about time for break time, so. So guys, we will take a 10 minute break. We'll be back. So we're not going to log off or anything, are we? We're no, going to no, just, just kind just of... Right. Just mute yourself and we'll be back in by yeah, five minutes to um, 11. Okay, uh, five minutes. minutes. I will I will be here in five minutes. So I'll say, guys, yeah, think about some questions when I ask. Uh, reflect on There's loads there. of questions here and, you know, we should try and, and go through all of them. I, don't I think think next we're going to go into in terms of your advice for journalists, uh, young budding journalists to you know, yes. end the industry, yes. what, what do you advise, yeah. uh, you know, what, how this, you know, who yeah. should they write for, should they start a blog, etc. Yes, like, so and I've just realised my brother is here as well, Salim, and he's even asked a question, so this is turning into a bit of a family event for me, which is great, I love it. Thank you all yes. for your support, <laughs> family. Perfect. Okay, Stay so family. Yeah, that'll be the topic after we are looking in terms of getting <laughs> into the industry, Thanks. what can you advise future journalists? Um, but yes, let's uh, take a break.
Okay, Shamim, can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Can everyone else hear? Yes. Perfect. Um, yes. So also, guys, um, in this section, um, I mean, don't, feel free to unmute yourself, ask a question. You know, let's make it like a you know, yes. a fire. You know, a fire. I don't know. I don't know what's the what's the term? Uh, firing session, if you want to call it like that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Let's, in, let's interrogate Shamim. Uh, you know, pick her brains. Don't feel. Uh, don't feel. Don't you know? He's don't feel shy. Uh, so so yeah, so as discussed before the uh, break, we were talking about it. Now let's look at. You know, we discussed the problem about representation in the media, the challenges uh, uh, Muslims face getting into the industry, plus the challenges we face in terms of our representation of stories. So let's look at in terms of, you know, how do we solve the problem huh? in terms of entering the media, getting more voices to represent, you know, our community, you know, especially in uh, Western media. Um, so, so Shamim, you know, you know, let's rewind time. You know, uh, imagine you're a young journalist. At, it's not rewind time, actually. Imagine you're a young journalist, journalist at this particular time. You know, uh, what would you do? What, what, how would you sort of, uh, you know, using the experience you have, you know, what advice would you give to journal, uh, young journalists wanting to get, get into the mainstream media, you know, you know challenge the narratives, uh, represent stories, etc. So what would you advise? Okay, well, my my response to that is going to be, uh, some might say, a bit of a dull one, and it's a very uncontroversial one, but it is something I believe absolutely passionately about, and I repeat it to the hilt. Um, if you are thinking of, if you are planning to work for an English language news organization, be it broadcast or print, then your standard of English has to be absolutely tip top because that is your weapon. You know, that is your greatest weapon. Your standard of English has to be at the highest level possible because if you're not, because if it isn't, you will automatically forget for a second what message you want to put out there, how you want to change the world, you know, if you, whether you want to be a voice for Muslims or Africans or Asians or whatever. If you, if you want to be working for the mainstream English language uh, media, then you really have to make sure that you can communicate um, in the best way possible in that language. Otherwise, you are automatically at a disadvantage. Then the way to do that is, and there's really no getting around it. Um, and the way to do that is, of course, to read, read widely. Reading improves every aspect of language from your uh, vocabulary to your grammar to your kind of use of creative language, everything that you all the tools you need in order to communicate effectively. You can never read enough. If you think you've read enough, read more. Um, and write. You have to write. You have to... Uh, television journalism involves writing. Um, so just, get, I mean, start writing, you know, from, you know, from, from the earliest opportunity. What I used to do... Sorry about that. Um, what on earth was that? that? Uh, <laughs> aliens. Goodness maybe me. Some, maybe someone's listening in. I know it's better. Uh, well, yeah, maybe they are. Um, what I used to do, um, and it helped me greatly, was I would pinpoint my favorite writers, not necessarily in terms of what they had to say, but their style of writing. And I would really kind of ponder on it and think of, you know, the, the effectiveness of their writing style, um, their kind of, talking about the technical side of things, you know, their kind of intro into, if I'm reading a 1000 word 
uh, feature. I would look at how they went into a piece, um, whether it was a visual intro or whether it was something that was flat, um, how they would formulate their argument, how they would construct their narrative. And then I would also do that later on with television reporters that I admired. Um, and I would draw inspiration from them and I would try to um, take tips from them. And I suppose, you know, for want of a better word, I would basically try and emulate them. I would try and copy them, but put my own distinct voice onto them. There's this thing, there is the, you, you hear a lot of this in journalism, you're developing your voice, developing your own style. But what I found is that that just comes with experience and that comes with practice. Um, but do that. I mean, it's a bit of a boring, boring response, I know. Um, I wish there was a magic wand that, you know, you could wave and you could, you know, just be, you know, wake up one morning and just kind of know what to say and know what to write and know how to tell a story. But unfortunately, it it it's, you know, it just comes with a lot of practice and um, a lot of diligence. You just have to just, you know, keep doing it. I, I you know, would just practice for years on end. Um, it's like anything, you know, if you want to if you want to master it, you know, you need to practice. Um, so that those are the, the that's the kind of the very, very, very basics. Pay attention to grammar as well. There's a really good book, actually. It's actually been around, and there's probably better ones that have come out since then, but the one that I can think of is, um, and uh, embarrassingly, I can't remember the, oh, Lynn Truce, I think her name is. Um, and it's called Eats, Shoots and Leaves. And it's a book on grammar. Um, and it's a really accessible, really, really kind of user-friendly book that will greatly enhance your writing um, because grammar really changes can change change the meaning of, of everything and you know the the, the whole um, reason why we have grammar is so that we make our writing more um, easier to understand and easier to read so focus on those things I mean it's really imperative it's really really important um, so I would say that Moving on from that, um, and just to repeat myself just once more, it is your greatest weapon. Um, so once you've established all of that, then uh, then you have to go through the standard process, you have to do the applications, look out for whatever publication, decide what it is that you want to do, whether it's, um, you know, whether you are interested in kind of political writing, political broadcasting, whether you want to be an analyst or a general reporter, um, whether you want to go into newspapers or uh, or print, focus on what it is that you want to do and then target those publications and uh, fill in applications, see if you can find out if there's someone within that organization who can give you some kind of guidance, who can be a mentor to you. Mentoring is is um, uh, is hugely helpful. We've all had mentors at various stages in our careers, and um, most of us will say that you know we 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 found it incredibly uh, incredibly helpful. So find out if there's any mentoring schemes in any organisations that particularly take your fancy. Be prepared to work really, 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 really hard, and be prepared to be frustrated, you know, for like eighty percent of the time for the first few years. Um, but it will pay off. Um, and you know, and the other thing is on the issue of diversity and inclusion. If you get rejections, and we know people get rejections because um, because of their names and because of their color, we know that is a fact. You know, this is the unjust world that we live in. Um, but we can either we can either accept it and become victims and turn away from it, or we can continue to fight it um, uh, to the hilt. You know, and change does come. It may not seem like it. Maybe desperately frustrating um, at times, but you have to believe that change will come. I do believe that, you know, my friends and I, we often talk on the phone about how, you know, we're being discriminated against because of our, you know, because of our color and our religion and our race. And, you know, in, 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 in the case of my female friends, our gender as well. Um, but you just have to keep going. One of the things that you can do is if you find that you are getting rejections, you can actually challenge the organization and you can say to them you know please can you tell me why is can you give me some feedback why was i rejected for this job when um you know it seems as though i have all the qualifications and who got the job and what did they have that i didn't have now if you're lucky 
Some of those organizations may give you truthful answers. Some may kind of brush you off. There are organizations as well. There are things like the black journalists organizations, the Muslim journalist organizations. There are lots of, you know, charitable organizations who can give you support and guidance and fight your corner as well um, and, you know, have your back. So, so seek out those organizations make contact with them um you know join them and keep them posted um keep them informed of you know your progress if you find that you're getting lots of rejections you know you, you just just turn to them and 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 seek advice you know there's also you know you can take legal action i mean that's a bit extreme and i don't really think that um many people do follow that path and if they do i don't know how successful they are but in theory that's an option as well and in the uk you have the national union of journalists mm -hmm. my experience of those uh, of, of the nuj has been very good they will fight your corner they will know your rights they will inform you of your rights um just be aware of of you know all of these you know organizations that are out there who can support you so that's that's what i would say but read a lot and write a lot write a lot because i didn't say that before enough so i'm saying it again read a lot and write a lot yeah I, i've always um because you're talking about determination, I mean, you really have to have a you're very determined to, you know... Uh, to I can't hear you very well, actually. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. So, what are you saying? No, no, no. So from my experience, yes, you have to be really determined. Um, you have to be really you know, really, determined. really get Especially in the early days, you have to be... Re you really want to get the foot in the door. Um, so in my experience, you, you know, sometimes you do have to maybe, you know, write for free or work for free in a broadcast station, um, you know, starting at the bottom, but once you, I guess, uh, got your foot into the door, then it becomes more comfortable in my experience. Um, yes, yes, getting your foot in the door, you know. And also, you know, bear in mind that most people, regardless of, um, of their background, generally have to start at the bottom. You know, I think there is this sense I don't know if it's a generational thing, um, but there, there seems to be, suddenly in my time, you know, you have to kind of do the crappy work, you know, for a long time and just, you know, shut up and put up, you know. Um, but it seems to me as though these days there's this sense that, uh, I'm going to sound like an old fogey here, but, um, you know, this sense that, um, you know, well, you know, why can't I just be a correspondent, you know, within two years of having joined this organization and um, this sense of entitlement, which I don't really think helps anyone, least of all the person concerned, because, um, you know, you, uh, I'm not sure that by fast tracking yourself, you will necessarily um, be as quality your the quality of your work will be as good as as someone who has put in the time and effort. Yeah, patience, uh, patience, I guess. Patience, patience I mean, is a virtue. I mean, if you can, if you can have a look at all the big journalists. I mean, they've been around for twenty years. You know, building the trade. Exactly. And, and, exactly. and that's how you know you become a good journalist. Um, but part of that, it I is. say, is is uh, passion. Passion is very important in journalism. I found the more. You know, if you said better journalists are those with, you know, very deep passion of reporting stories, you know, reporting stories of underrepresented people, issues. Um, and also, I, I can, if you, from a personal level, um, there is an uh, Islamic sort of motivation as well. Uh, I mean, as part of our job as uh, Muslims is to enjoy the good, forbid the evil. And journalism is, is part of that. You are enjoying the good, you are forbid the, forbidden the evil. Also, is about. Um, I mean, there is a hadith about you know the best of you know jihad um, is the word of um, truth to a tyrant ruler, um, and I've always found this as a sort of um, motivation. Source about, of inspiration. It's, it's inspiration. Always them in terms of you're speaking to power. Uh, in this sense, it's it's the it's the ruler. You know, you can apply it to governments. You can apply it to people people in power. Um, so I've always found um, it's also a very uh, Islamic responsibility as well uh, in terms of as journalists. You know, you are the you are the you are the person who are who's gonna um, you know enjoying the good for other people for the wider community, forbid the evil, um, you know, seek out injustices, etc. So I, I think there's also a noble element, there's also a noble element to uh, journalism as well, which I yes, very I much so. As, uh, future journalists 
you know, to keep that in mind, that is a big responsibility. Absolutely. If you um, believe in, if you're a believer in the truth, then journalism is 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 for you. If you believe that your mission is to it, spread the truth and tell the truth, um, then 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 it is for you. And um, no, I, I I agree with you 100%. Um, Afsal, there is absolutely a religious and moral um, imp imperative in 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 journalism, and that is why I think you know it's really really important to have you know more more to hear more Muslim voices. I think more important than ever before. But uh, you know you need to you need to get the training and you need to um, have the tools and then and then you know you you will be successful. Um, don't try and cut corners. Um, but the Muslim voice is one that needs to be um, needs to be heard. It's not being heard loud enough. I mean you know we do have you know the likes of Al Jazeera and TRT World. Thank goodness. Um, and you know, to be fair, even the BBC, you know, has vastly improved. And you have Channel Four News, which I respect very much. You know, the Guardian newspaper, which I res respect very much. But then the other, there's the other side of the coin as well. Uh, more and more, kind of, you know, anti, you know, what well, xenophobic and racist and um, uh, kind of anti-Semitic and anti-Muslim um, rhetoric that is out there that um, many media outlets are providing a platform for um i mean i know this is you know we are talking you know this is the um organized by the istanbul muslim collective but let's not forget that you know diversity in all forms you know needs to be addressed you know gender equality um regardless of what your your race and religion you know we know that women are still um being paid far less for doing you know the same the same work as men you know this is a very serious issue in the 20th century you know this is we're still having to battle that um and if you happen to be a woman from an ethnic minority background then that's a kind of a double whammy um, you know, people with disabilities are being discriminated against. They're being refused jobs, um, you know, jobs that they're perfectly capable of doing. This isn't just in the media. This is, you know, across all industries. And, you know, all of these need to be, you know, need, need, need to be addressed. Anti-Semitism, you know, has been on the rise in Europe um, for a very long time. And I'm very, you know, ashamed to say that, you know, we, we see anti-Semitism, you know, in sections of the Muslim community as well. And, you know, all of us should be working to um you know to tackle to tackle these things and by that i even mean you know casual racism it doesn't help anyone um it certainly doesn't make for a better world um and if you if you as a group are persecuted then you should have empathy for other groups who are persecuted as well i'm a big believer in that you know um muslims are disadvantaged in so many ways um and because of that, we need to have compassion for other groups as well, you know, exactly. regardless, the, regardless of their beliefs. Uh, and joining the truth wherever it is, you know. Um, Absolutely. Um, I, I do want to ask everyone, um, you know, feel free to unmute yourself. You know, I mean, you guys can. Yeah, act I mean, you don't have to. You don't have to write the questions if you want to. Yeah, because yeah, I'll say you can act you as a journalist to... right now. Unmute yourself. Ask, pretend you're interviewing. Well, there's loads of questions on here, actually, uh, which we haven't. You know, fire your questions, you know, pick your brains. Um, I would also say, all right, let's talk about uh, more serious matters, you know. As, as much as you have a passion for journalism, is there any money in journalism? This is, at the end of the day, you need to make a living. Uh, it very much depends. Um, it's not, I mean, look, if you're a graduate and, uh, you know, you want to, you know, and you want to get a graduate job and making money is your priority, then don't go into journalism. If you want to just like go into go into finance, go into banking, going to law, medicine, these pay really, really well. Journalism, in comparison to other kind of professional graduate professions, um, does not pay well, and it's a very um, it's a very kind of unstable profession in many ways as well. 50, around something like fifty percent of all journalists are freelance. What that means is that you don't have job security, you don't get holiday pay, you don't get a pension, you don't get all sorts of um, kind of um, financial benefits and security that other jobs give you. Um, you need to bear that in mind. Um, 
I would say if you're not, I mean, I would just say it's it's a really it's a really really tough industry. There's no doubt about it. Um, it's it's cutthroat. It is tough to get into, and even if you can get into it, um, it's very tough to kind of. There's no kind of linear corporate ladder um, in the same way that there is for other professions. If you're a doctor and you're, you know good at your job and you work hard enough, you know that 10 years down the line or 12 years down the line, you will become a consultant. There's no guarantee because there's no kind of structure in that sense to journalism. It's not like you do this and then you become this and then you become this. And it doesn't really work like that. It's kind of, you know, it's all very fluid and, you know, there's no kind of formal kind of career progression in that sense. You need to bear that in mind. Um, you know, um, I think kind of even mid you know unless you happen to be working for a on a kind of you know decent position mid-level management position or the equivalent I suppose that would be kind of senior broadcast journalist at the BBC or something I don't know then you can expect to earn a decent salary but it's never ever going to be megabucks that I will tell you for now um if you become a correspondent, then you will probably earn a decent wage. If you are a news editor or an EP, so basically kind of senior management level, then you can you can you can um, expect to earn uh, a decent wage. But um, you know the people who make a lot of money are, I mean, I would say it's like I don't know. I mean, I'm just guessing here, but something like. 0.5% if that I mean don't quote me on that statistics but that's just to give you an idea of just how small that percentage is if you're looking at kind of a six-figure salary you know it's you know it's going to banking go into well, banking on the don't, don't side, be a corporate lawyer well, on the positive side you get to travel the world you, you know, do visit various places you know be in touch with people you know you get access to people which you, you know you know what Yes. Absolutely... You know, I have to say it is for me, it is, you know, I can't imagine doing anything else. It is the most exciting, wonderful profession, unpredictable, dynamic profession that anyone can ever do. And I know I'm biased, but I absolutely love being a journalist. It gives you access. It's a privilege to be a journalist. It gives you access into people's lives. It gives you, people give you license to talk to them, to ask them questions that you would most likely never do. I mean, I have met, I have interviewed people ranging from Korean war veterans. I went to Korea and spoke to war veterans in their mid 80s who fought in the Korean war in the 50s. When they told me their stories, they cried. They started crying, telling me when they were remembering their stories. Now, just think of how humbling that experience was for me. Just think of what a privilege that was for me, you know, to, to be in the presence of these people and for them to tell me their stories. What other job is going to allow me to do that? Yes, you can be a CEO of a financial company or whatever, and you can, you know, stay in the best hotels and fly all over the world, business class and all the rest of it. But you're going to be in a boardroom having some boring meeting and then you're going to go in a hotel and yes you'll have some but it's not you don't taste real life you don't taste the essence of real life you don't get into the hearts of people and nothing in the world compares to that nothing in the world you know one minute you are speaking to a refugee who has lost everything um and they trust you you know what can be a greater honor than someone putting their trust in you? What can be more humbling? What can make, what can be a greater, um, uh, what can make you feel more like a human being than someone, a stranger, coming, putting their trust in you and telling you their story? There can be no greater privilege. Um, for me, there, there can't be, you know, all the money in the world. I mean, we're all put on, we're, we're put on business, we're put on, whatever we go we're on economy class usually on an overnight flight it's usually horrendous and you know it doesn't matter whether you're traveling 12 hours or 10 hours we're on some economy class cramped economy class flight and then we're given unrealistic um 
assignments and you know we have to go for when you're on the field I mean it's really really tough you know you can go for days on end you know with like four hours sleep and the news desk making all sorts of unreasonable demands you know we want this we want that we want this and sometimes you just think the physical and mental exhaustion is just going to be too much for me but you but it's it's such a privilege it's just you know it's it's just such a humbling humbling thing to do you know one one minute you're in interviewing uh um a refugee the next minute you're interviewing the foreign minister of you know some country the next day it's some you know activist who's dedicated his or her life to their cause next minute it's a war veteran you know every per every kind of person from every walk of life you know, I, I I have met and spoken to and interviewed pretty much every kind of person from every walk of life, from Syria to, you know, Spain to the east end of London to, you know, the Rohingya refugee camps in Bangladesh to some, you know, monastery in Sri Lanka. Um, you know, where yeah, else so, do you get I mean, that? Yeah, well, whatever job, whatever job will allow that, unless you're a what other job travel, will allow that? Unless you're a travel blogger, which it's very hard to do. Um, I do have but even if, you're, even if you're a travel blogger, you're still kind of yeah, you don't get the same know. experience because the access uh, as a journalist you get, you know, it's something unique. Um, I do have some questions. Um, yeah. There's one interesting question which I've sort of always wondered. Um, do you have to be a graduate of journalism to get a better chance at, uh, you know, being successful? Or is it better to be a graduate of, you know, by like politics, international relations or economics, like specializing in a field which can help uh, contribute to your journalism, which I found actually a lot of the, uh, the better journalists are those who specialized in this subject. And yes. they picked up yes. journalism Not only, the way, yes. courses, etc. Yes. Not, um, I mean, journalism and media studies degrees and um, that has kind of been the criticism um of those degrees since they kind of since universities started including them in their kind of you know subjects um you know in, in the subjects that they offered and that is that um those kind of skills you can probably pick up on the job and they're not quite academic enough to demonstrate um, a person's academic abilities. Um, that loosely has been the criticism that media studies students, students and journalism and students have found. I tend to be of that school of thought. I think that um, the problem with doing media studies in journalism is just they're a little bit too vocational and they don't go enough. I, I, I'm not I'm not convinced that they challenge you academically enough. And I think being academic, I think the point of going to university is to be academically challenged so that you can um uh you know you are in an environment where you can really push your kind of intellectual abilities to the limit um and i'm not sure if media studies and journalism courses can do that added to the fact that um you can often do them after you've done your undergraduate degree, which is what I did. So I would say that, um, and you know, times have really changed since I was at university. So I can't claim to be um, an expert on the right path to take, but I tend to think that, you know, don't necessarily feel that you have to do a media studies or journalism degree um, as an undergrad. I mean, unless you, you know, unless you just want to do it because that's what you want to do. I mean, I don't want to put anyone off, but I don't necessarily think it increases your chances of getting a job in journalism. No, I definitely that I definitely don't 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 think um, is the case. Bearing in mind that a lot of people go and do whatever it is that they wanted to do, be it, 
English literature or history or whatever it is, you know, or, you know, even, I mean, I'm a science graduate, even things like, you know, I mean, we have people, uh, uh, I've worked with people in newsrooms who have physics degrees and who have, you know, math degrees and, um, and all of that. I think, I tend to think that uh, those kind of more um, classic subjects will challenge you more and will nurture your kind of critical thinking more and critical thinking is is really the um, you know the the kind of backbone of of higher education, isn't it? It's 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 it, you, to develop critical thinking. And in many ways, the subject itself is secondary. Um, um, bearing in mind, once you've done those courses, you can then go on to do a kind of a journalism kind of like a master's degree or a postgraduate diploma or something like that, which is, you know, really helpful. So, I mean, that's what I did. You know, I did an English degree. Uh, so I didn't do an English degree. I did a chemistry degree. Um, and then I did a master's degree, um, again, in an academic subject in, 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 in kind of like a political science subject. And then after that, I did the postgraduate diploma at City University. Um, and you know, and a lot of people of my generation and below me did that as well, and I think it stood them in good stead. Rather than doing something like media studies, I would say do whatever it is you know that you want to do, and get some practical um, experience in journalism. This is something that people seem to think that they can cut corners on, but it's actually really, um, it's actually really uh, important, and it will really put you at an advantage. So if any of you are thinking of going into journalism or any of you want to advise your children or your nieces or your nephews or your friends or your friend's children or anybody in your in your group, in your social circle, you should encourage them. If they come up to you and say, mummy, daddy, uncle, you know, whatever, um, I really want to be a journalist, say to them, start doing things like writing for your school newspaper or school news or school online you know newsletter or whatever it is if there's a local radio station go and ask if you can do some shifts there like hospitals have radio stations you know and a lot of kind of young kids go and kind of start there or um um local newspapers i went to my local newspaper the ealing gazette and i said you know please can i do some work experience and then i used to um and they agreed and i used to go along one day a week and i was actually working full time and i i managed to get a week a day off during the week and i used to drive to ealing and it was the ealing gazette i think it was and they got me doing their arts and entertainment page i mean they got me starting off writing these small pieces um, and then it, I ended up doing their entire arts and entertainment pages. And that was really, really excellent experience. So you can still go and do whatever subject that you're interested in, which is not necessarily media studies, but really get practical experience. And all universities have their university magazines and their online, you know, newsletters and all of that. Get involved in all of that because that's, you know, that's actually, you know, just as helpful. And you should do it because, you know, when you go on to your first job, you know, people will ask and it, and it will really impress people to know that you're serious about journalism and that you've taken active steps to, you know, to achieve to achieve your goal. Um, I think Ibrahim has raised his hand. Um, Ibrahim, do you want to ask a question? So if you unmute yourself, or was that by mistake? Yes, um, I didn't hear that actually. It's lagging a bit. Can you uh, read Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Yes. Can you? Yes, yes. just uh, uh, just uh, increase, uh, I mean, just speak louder. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes, just a bit louder. Yeah, go ahead. Um, sorry, maybe I should get my headset so um, I can call back again. It's okay, we can hear oh, you fine now. We can hear you, we can hear you. Go on, your question. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, um, thank you very much for this um, opportunity to listen to you. Though we have been seeing on the oh. media, we don't have the access to, <laughs> to ask you some questions. Um, you know, you have so many experience, you know, traveling around the world and um, also reporting from people and um, trying to trying to tell the world um, people, you know, information or story from their own point of view. Um, 
I have some questions. Um, this is uh, very disturbing to me because um, I live here in Turkey. And um, the way media represent Africa, for instance, now, when something happens in a village in Africa, they generalize that, oh, this happened in Africa. There's a drought in Africa. You know what I mean? And this just happened in a city or in a village. So these have a negative impact on the, on the Africans living in, the, in Turkey or in other places, especially the NGOs have, uh, have done more harm to the, to the African people than, good, than the good they have done recent, uh, in recent years. They will go to some village, like helping people there, and they generally, uh, we came to Africa to help them. So when you walk on the street, or Africans in general, when they see you, the first thing they ask you is, do you have water? Um, how do you grow up? You know what I mean? They start seeing you, see, um, you, you come from the, you know, everybody in Africa come from the village. You know what I mean? Yeah, come from I the, hear the, you. Drive. I hear you. Yeah, yeah, I get what you're saying. So recently, uh, like yesterday also, TRT World posted, uh, you know, they interview a Turkish um, NGO in Africa and um, in a village. And the guy said, we have come to Africa to give them light, to give them water. And he keep mentioning Africa. And uh, the report also, the report also is, he keeps saying Africa. You know what I mean? Like, how mm. can we um, tackle this? in the media on how can we review this or how can we, you know, um, limit this? Because this generalization, this generalization has cost us a lot. Has cost us our yeah, yeah, and yeah. our honor. Yeah, this is, it's a very good question. Um, and I, and I, and I, and I totally understand the point that you're making. Um, and that is that by, um emphasizing on something some misfortune or something that may be happening in a very small part of any country um the impression that people get is that the whole co uh, country is suffering and you know has no water and you know that's what so um and coming from bangladesh my parents are originally from bangladesh i totally understand where you are coming from what you are saying is there is so much more, you know, these misconceptions are, um, are encouraged um, by new negative news reports because this is, you know, there is so much more to Afri many African countries and Bangladesh. In Bangladesh's clay ca case, floods and cyclones, people think it's all just starving people, floods and cyclones, whereas I know, you know, there, there, there's a different side to it and we all know there's a very different side to Africa. It is very frustrating. I understand your frustrations. Um, the problem is that news in many ways, by its very nature, is negative. If something positive is happening or if nothing is happening, it's not going to make news. You know, if it's, a, if it's a jolly old, happy old day in Bangladesh or in, you know, Sierra Leone and wherever and everybody's going about their business and, you know, nothing much has happened, it's not going to make news. It's only when an event happens that it becomes news. And more often than not, it happens to be, that event happens to be a negative thing. It happens to have a negative impact on, you know, the people who are experiencing it. And when you... Um, you know, when you hear that on the news, then you kind of think, oh, my God, you know, nobody in Africa has any water or everybody in Bangladesh is, you know, is is being drowned in a in a cyclone or a flood. You know, I, I you know, I. But news has been like this since the beginning of time and there have been efforts to counter that um, and kind of show um the more positive side of a country or a continent or an area, but then they don't fall into the news category. They fall into something else like a culture show or a food show or a, you know, so it's a very difficult one for me to answer because I don't really see how, um, how we can change that. And I sympathize, you know, with your frustrations because I feel it myself and I'm, I'm sure many, many people do as well. But just to kind of say to you that I know you said you felt frustrated about something that was on TRT recently, but to, um, but we also have a half hour. It's quite new. It's a half, I think it's, it started becoming half hour. It was kind of five minutes to start off with. And there are plans to make it half an hour called um, uh, Africa Matters. And that actually covers a whole range of stories, not just, um, you know, not just kind of miss unfortunate events that are happening in in one part of africa or another it kind of you know it's it's aim is to be a bit more kind of 
all encompassing and have some kind of positive stories um, as well. So I suppose, you know, I suppose that's 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 how you would go about it by balancing, you know, the negative stories with with positive ones. And I do think that, um, you know, a lot of new ch news channels are trying to do that. Okay, um, I think we're, we are running out of time, unfortunately. We have about five minutes. So if anyone has any pressing questions, I mean, I'm, I'm going to look at the questions that we've had. Um, I think we've ready. missed a lot of questions. So but what I will say... You can have a quick look. Um, you, know. you know what? I want to answer... I'm going to be a little bit biased here, and I am going to answer... I would like to answer my brother's question, because, um, um, you know, he's... <laughs> I'm very grateful that he joined. Um, although I can't read them now. Hold on, where are they? Um, but I would say uh, many of the questions that we haven't answered, um, I mean, we, uh, Shamim um, will have a look later on and she can send me the uh, her responses to it and then I'll send it into the group. Yes, so, yes. But actually, I am going to... Salim asked a question um, and I actually think it's a very... Salim is my brother um, and I actually think it's a very interesting question. Um, Young people these days get all their news from social media sites like Twitter and Facebook. Well, actually, it's not just young people, actually. Um, how do you get the younger generations to watch TV news channels like TRT? Uh, switch it on. Put your telly on and uh, switch over to the channel and draw your kids around and take their iPads and iPhones off them and just say, watch this with me for five minutes, ten minutes. Um, I don't know, just point, you know, maybe point out stories that are particularly interesting, if there are pictures that are interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, television is all about pictures. If there's a dramatic mm -hmm. picture of wildfires or, you this know... Is actually, uh, sorry, Shumim, sorry to interrupt you. This is actually a very important point in terms of the future of news. Uh, you know, right now, I mean, far fewer people watch TV, broadcast news. It's mm -hmm. all digital now. Yes. And you see a lot of the bigger organizations like Al Jazeera, now TRT, CGTN, they're now focusing a lot of the efforts in yes. digital news, which is a different format. Um, maybe you can briefly talk about that in terms of the switch between, you know, more traditional yes. news to now digital news, which a lot of people are consuming. Just briefly, uh, we are running out of time. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I think this is a, a battle. This is a losing battle, isn't it? I don't, I don't, I don't see any reverse in this trend. Um, and actually, um, even, you know, even TRT and Al Jazeera, you know, well, actually, Al Jazeera still has a lot of kind of TV viewers, but uh, many of these new channels that are emerging, they have a TV channel because it's more for the prestige rather than, you know, they're not really too bothered about how many people are watching them. You know, audience figures don't matter to to them as much as kind of online traffic um they need to have that channel because it gives them a certain kind of um kudos it gives them prestige but really you know i mean if we we do something and it doesn't go online we kind of feel like we've wasted our time you know you might have i don't know several thousand people watching us when we're actually on the telly but if it goes online you know that number goes up by you know tenfold twentyfold thirtyfold um i don't see how that can be reversed but people do watch tv in things like or at least they're on in you know hotels and airports and public places you'll often find you know tv channels on and the kind of regular channels you'll see them then in people's houses probably not so much um but you can still watch those channels online though because you can still stream I mean, like if you go onto YouTube, you know, you can actually watch Sky News and Al Jazeera and ITV News and BBC and all of those. Um, yeah, I guess that, that's the future. That's the future of journalism. It and is think, the future. It is I the future. My advice to, whether, we, uh, whether we like it or not. Yeah. And my advice to a future, you know, but in journalists is also understand the digital form of journalism yes. in terms of understanding how to make news for online. And I think that's actually a very important uh, sort of point that they need to equip themselves with this as well. E yes. In terms of learning how to shoot, learning how to edit, you know, these yes. things are now, you know, everyone wants you to be a 
jack of all trades in journalism, literally. Definitely, definitely. And I have to say, that wasn't the case when I was first starting out. Um, so it's even taken me quite some time to get my head around it all. And I'm not entirely sure that I completely have. But what I will say is, is the medium might be changing. The way we access news and current affairs might be changing. But that doesn't mean to say the quality has to change. Those are the, 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 the basic fundamentals of good journalism, good writing, good storytelling will always be the same. Some, you know, regardless of whether you're watching something on Facebook or, um, or um, you know, uh, YouTube or whatever. I mean, if it's a badly told story, if it's an inaccurate story, if the fundamental principles of journalism are not going to be there, it doesn't matter where you watch it. It's going to be a bad piece of journalism. Exactly. So Shamim, um, we are running out of time now. There is about five minutes to the end. So uh, I'll let you now conclude in terms of everything we've spoken so far. I mean, what advice sort of, you know, just just a, like a wrap up sort of message to young budding journalists who are on this group. Um, and, you know, uh, well, to young know. budding journalists, I would say it is a fantastic profession. It is, it is really... Uh, you know, it, for me, it is like there's, it's inconceivable that I would want to do anything else. And I once joked with a friend of mine and I said, you know, if I ever become a millionaire, I'm still going to go to work and I'm still going to be a journalist. And I mean it. I, I love it as much. That's not to say that I'm frustrated. I'm not frustrated on a, on a, on a daily basis. But um, fundamentally, I love it. If it's what you want to do, go for it. And if you, if you work hard enough and if you are passionate enough, you will get there you will it may take a long time but you will get there um so that is my advice to you but just you know you have to work hard you know it's that saying isn't it you know the road to success is is there are no shortcuts to the um to the road on the road to success um and just don't give up and have faith you know have faith in um uh in your abilities and in in the goodness of people there will always be people out there who will help you. There are there are many many people who have, you know, helped me um, in my career who I will be eternally grateful to. And um, you know, just have faith in your beliefs, in your religion, and and um, work hard. Um, I will say that I first of all, um, and and I just want to say thank you all so much um, for joining this session. I hope it was useful. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure. I also want to say apologies to all the questions that we didn't get to answer. Um, but the end of this session does not necessarily mean that's the end. Um, Afsal will put up my contact details and I will be more than happy to answer your questions. You, any of one of you can contact me at any stage, either by email or on LinkedIn or Twitter um, or whatever. We'll put your details up now. If anyone wants yes. to take a phone. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how many people will be able to um, get them. Maybe if we, I don't know. I don't I, know I'll, I'll put it in the group afterwards. We'll do, we'll oh, yes. Yeah. And, uh, and um, we'll have a look at the questions that haven't been answered. And I mean, she'll get back and send it to me. And, you know, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So apologies for not uh, for not um, answering all the questions. I, I, I you know, I, I would love to have gotten, but I think we've run out of time. But I, I, um, will promise you that if you want me to answer them and if you if you let me know on the group, then uh, I will do so. But okay. thank you, thank you all so much. It's been a real, um, it's been an honor. Great, okay. It was not the end yet, guys. I just let me just a few more minutes of your time. Uh, so thank you, Jishamim. Um, I mean, that was really enlightening and I hope um, all of you have found some sort of inspiration or, or even like a, a insight into the world of journalism. Um, I mean, some journalists are hated, that's the fact as well. There's, there's also that side as well. A lot of people don't like journalists, but also on the, on the other side, journalism is also a noble profession. And uh, I believe in ethical journalism and uh, journalism that change, changes things things in the world. Um, and it's there is Islamic motivation of, you know, it is our, our job to enjoy this world forbidden to eat, forbid the evil, not just uh, on a... Um, you know, if you, if you think about it, it's also journalists do that job you know, for the community. So bear that in mind. Um, so I would, I would now pass on to Sumbul. He's going to talk about future topics that we're going to discuss in, in this series. Um, so there's exciting ones coming up. Um, 
And uh, yeah, I'll get someone to say a few words. So before before you do that, I just want to um, extend my thanks to Sumbul and to you, Afsal, for organizing this event and for inviting me. You did a great job. Thank you both so much. I really, really appreciate it. Um, and um, it's been a real privilege. So thank you. Yes. Actually, we, we, we thank you for your lovely speech and your time. It was amazing, like, especially for our first installment, Muslims in the Industrial Series. It means a lot to us. And I just wanted to say thank you on behalf of our community. And uh, also, I want to thank Afsal for moderating this session today. It was amazing. And for also IMC, I thank IMC for collaborating with us. Actually, we look forward to collaborating with uh, all Muslim communities across the world. Now we are in touch, inshallah, there will be more upcoming events. And before we finish the session, I just wanted, because some of our friends couldn't catch the first uh, couple of minutes, so they missed the introduction part. Actually, today we concluded the first installment of the Muslims in Industry series. We looked at all things about journalism and Actually, um, I was I, I showed I, I shared a promo video about our uh, academy. So what Istanbul Academy is doing, youth academy is doing. So basically, Istanbul Youth Academy, people like have a lot of questions in mind. What is Istanbul Youth Academy? Are you under something or you are working with? Actually, we are collaborating with different Muslim organization across the world. We we were established three months ago in twenty twenty one. So this was our the first part of Muslims in Industry series. And as it's shown in the video, Istanbul Youth Academy is an organization for Muslim youth who want to improve themselves and expand both their intellectual and spiritual knowledge. Basically, we have five main aims. Like the first one is like more for youth or it's YouTube videos, podcasts, and interviews with different people from across the world. So guys, now you can check our YouTube page. There will be some videos. It, it, it will be uploaded soon. So the second thing is our website. So there will be blogs. You can visit our website, www.istanbulyouthacademy.com. So our young volunteers, brothers and sisters, will be sharing their experiences and knowledge with you about different issues. The third one online courses and workshops as you know since the corona started our lifestyle completely changed so we wanted to make most of it there will be different kind of courses starting from four till 16 weeks programs about history about journalism about engineering coding media different fields whatever you want you can let us know if you have anything in mind please do not hesitate to contact us so the for the fifth one is about more networking for those who are basically those who need some network and some because we went through some problems when we start when we start university and we don't want our brothers and sisters to go the same so we want to help them in that case so basically we'll have an academic network program for youth long-term networking we will be having a regular meeting with experienced people to keep our network and to consult them in case of need about our fields and stuff and another the last one uh, the mentor mentee programs for BAs, for master and for PhD students will be having and creating a huge network with those who are experiencing their fields and will be assigning them to our friends, our brothers and sisters as mentors. So they will be in touch with them and make most of their time on the way of their career path. And it was very good night. Please let us know about your opinions. We are open to everybody's ideas and suggestions. Do not hesitate to contact us. And you can follow our Instagram page. You can just open it and write, search it, Istanbul Youth Academy. So we can stay in touch. Also, we have Telegram channels and social media accounts. So this was the end of our first meeting. I again wanted to and express my gratitude to Shamim for this lovely speech and for her time. And again, my pleasure. moderating Afsal, this um, amazing event, and for IMC for collaborating, and for especially like whoever attended today's sessions, I wanted to thank you all uh, for your.
auspicious time. It was an amazing night. And we are going to conclude the night. We're going to finish the event here. Before we uh, finish, we're going to share with you our promo videos that we will be finishing the sessions. Uh, thank you all for attending. It was an amazing night. And take care of yourself. Assalamu alaikum.